Welcome everybody <clears throat> to the to this final stage of uh, of a long and very interesting day. We are having uh, three more presentations. Hi, Dan Daniel. Hello. Very Sorry. nice to have you here. You are you are going to talk about untangling media wiki. That is I'm right. Sure, I'm sure that doesn't have anything to do with uh, with pizza, but everything with uh, spaghetti. Mm, yeah. So spaghetti. you talked about spaghetti. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say uh, I think it's uh, half past seven over here in Europe. So the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I can get the presentation going. Um, just a second. All right. It's so odd that I cannot see my audience. I don't know if I'm talking to one person or to a hundred and if you know everyone is really bored or super entertained. Anyway, um, welcome everyone to my talk about uh, untangling media wiki. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about what we have been up to at the Wikimedia Foundation to improve um, the structure and, and quality of the MediaWiki core code base. Um, right. Uh, a year ago, we embarked on the expedition. Um, we called it the expedition because we know kind of where we want to go and where we want to end up but we don't exactly know the route we need to take and we kind of expect to be hitting obstacles and having to backtrack and so on. So the background is um, MediaWiki has grown into a pretty big tangle over uh, its existence. And yeah, it's a kind of tangle that is otherwise known as a, a big ball of mud. And uh, this is an actual representation of the class dependencies. And this um, <laughs> structure makes it hard to understand um, and hard to change and hard to fix things. Because if you touch, you touch one class and you don't know what other bits of the system you may be affecting. And uh, we would like to fix this by imposing some structure by decoupling components um, on, on all levels. Wouldn't it be nice if the MediaWiki code base looked something like this, right? You have domains in the verticals that are mostly isolated and talk to each other through narrow interfaces. You have a clear separations of different layers from storage up to the user interface, right? That would be a very nice to have, but unfortunately, we have these monsters sitting in there um, that kind of tie everything together, uh, that cross all the domain boundaries and cross um, the layers and make um, life hard for developers. So these, we are we are looking for, um, or the the monsters we are trying to find and uh, to slay are uh, classes that do a lot of things, right? and are used in a lot of places. And by by doing a lot of things, so they touch a lot of other code and they're uh, used a lot, they effectively tie everything into a big knot. And there's lots and lots of different ways um, to slice and dice the code base. There's ideas about you know turning it into a structured monolith or extracting bits and pieces of it into separate services or focusing on layering or focusing on domains. And no matter what we do, we have to deal with these monster classes. They, they are always in the way, no matter what direction we want to take. So in order to figure out where the worst bits are or to phrase it more positively, where our work would be most effective. Um, we looked at some of the classical um, code quality metrics, like the weighted method. What, what is it? Weighted method count, WMC. 
and um, looked at the top offenders there, uh, you, you can see that we have a lot of numbers in the excess of 500 here, a lot of scores. And a good number is something below 50, right? So we have quite a bit of work to do. Now, looking, looking at these classes that we have there, uh, again, the question is, wh where do we start? So we look at another measure, which is afferent coupling, which basically tells us how often are these things used. And if we compare the two lists, then we see um, two things show up fairly high on both of them, title and user. And uh, if you have been doing anything with MediaWiki code, you know these classes, uh, you have used them, and maybe you looked inside and found several thousand lines of code that um, looks kind of confusing. And yeah, these are the first two monsters that we want to tackle. Yeah, these guys. But how did we even get here? How did we end up um, in this unfortunate situation? And it all kind of started rather innocently, as it often does. Um, I want to tell you a little story, a little story about an elephant. I guess you all know the uh, story about the elephant in the dark room. You probably have heard it a dozen times. This is not that story. Anyway, so uh, once we had an elephant and it was good, it was the elephant we needed. And then we found that well, we don't always need that trunk, right? It's kind of optional. And then we found sometimes, sometimes we need that elephant to have wings. But when it has wings, we don't really need the legs. And then we kind of found that everything is kind of optional and we no longer really understand what an elephant even is. But we were so committed to using elephants that we just kept adding to the pile. And yes, that is how we ended up where we are now. And if we take the title class <clears throat> as an example, um, if you have used, uh, if you have worked with MediaWiki code, you probably have a pretty good idea what the title class is and what it represents. But if you look kind of closely at it, then this uh, image becomes more blurry. Uh, because, for instance, the title has an associated page ID, unless the page doesn't exist, then there is no page ID. And the title has a namespace, right? But if it's an internet wiki link then it doesn't have a namespace. Well, the namespace will, it will pretend to be in the main namespace, but that's not really true. It's somewhere, it's on a different site, right? So we don't even know what namespace it is in. Um, yeah, a title has a page name, except if it's a link to a section on your current page, then it doesn't have a page name. And uh, a title may have, or should have an associated talk page, or you would assume so, but um, it could also be a special page. Special pages don't have talk pages. And there's really nothing in a title object that would always be there and always make sense. It's all kind of optional and maybe it's useful, but maybe it's just pretending to be. Similarly, if you think of operations that you can perform on a title, right? The title can be viewed. Um, you can go to a wiki and tell it, show me this uh, title except if it's an interwiki link, then it can't. And um, you can watch pages, right? So you have a title object, you can tell it that you want to watch it. But if it's a section jump or a special page, right, that operation will fail because you can't watch it. Um, or titles can be renamed, except if there are special pages or section jumps or interwiki links, because then they are not even pages, they are links, right? So, um, if you look closely at it, it turns out that the title object really represents a number of different things that are, well, they're not unrelated, they're somewhat related, but they're definitely not the same thing. And yeah, so our vocabulary is pretty unclear. And using unclear vocabulary leads to confusion, and confusion leads to bugs. Yeah, these guys. So what do we do? What do we want to do? How do we fix it? We want to replace these monster classes with a more lightweight vocabulary um, that can be used to communicate between uh, layers, that can be used to communicate between uh, different domains. 
And yeah, we, we have the slide weight vocabulary of, of, um, of value objects. And on the other hand, we have service objects that will um, be used to perform operations related to uh, pages, users, and so on. So what we did was basically look at all, all these um, tentacles that these monsters had been spreading all over the code base. And we started to extract code and uh, turn it into standalone um, entities. Um, yeah, entities, value objects, command objects, um, service objects. Or in the words of Lewis Carroll, uh, we went snickersnack and chopped these monsters up a bit. Um, we have been making some progress with that. Uh, this is a graph that shows the usage of um, the user class and the title class and some other others over time. And this is the progress over the last year. And as you can see, we have been replacing user and title in quite a few places in the code base. But you can also see that um, the going is slow and it will be a while until we actually finish. So for the user class, we brought down the numbers by uh, roughly 40%. It kind of depends on how you count. In this graph, it more, looks more like 60%. So yeah, depending on how you count, it's somewhere around these numbers. And um, if, if you look a little bit more at the, the structure of the code, if you look at the uh, domains, the domain boundaries we, we want to have, and you look at the violations or, uh, of these boundaries, so the, um, how many times you have a class in, in one domain that access a class in another domain that you should not be accessing, then uh, in the case of the user object, we went from 23 violations um, with 145 tolerated accesses that are not great, but not flagged as an actual violation. Um, two years ago to seven violations and 100 tolerated now, which is, I would say progress, right? But we are not there yet. Yeah, you can see this number, these numbers here also show in the internal complexity of the classes going down. So very rough roadmap. Um, over the last couple of releases, we have introduced new interfaces that are more narrow that can be used instead of the uh, monster classes. Um, we have deprecated a lot of old methods. We have introduced new hooks that use the new more narrow definitions. And eventually in some future release, we will probably get rid of user and title entirely. Um, and we will also uh, deprecate a lot of the old hooks and of course the old hook system itself will be deprecated, but that's a different story. Um, so how, how do we go about this? And in particular, how do we go about it without breaking stuff, right? We don't really want to move fast and break stuff. We kind of have to go slowly so we can avoid breaking stuff. Um, on the one hand, because uh, at the Wikimedia Foundation, we don't have like a terrible lot of, of, of headroom for errors and breakage. And also because we have literally hundreds of uh, hundreds of thousands of sites running MediaWiki and hundreds or even thousands of people writing, um, maintaining extensions for MediaWiki uh, that um, we need to, we need to uh, take into consideration. So in, in order to make this uh, easier, we created the stable interface policy, which clarifies what people can rely on when interfacing with MediaWiki core. And uh, we have removed some guarantees or some assumptions, and we have also added some um, and tried to clarify things a lot over the last years. So basically calling things in, in core is still fine. Right, but all the other things, all the other stuff that you could do, like um, instantiating classes, implementing interfaces, subclassing, all these things are generally unsafe, um, and you should avoid doing them unless they are explicitly documented to be safe. What do I want to 
talk about. Yes. So we broke title into a number of things, into a number of narrow interfaces, uh, value objects implementing these interfaces, and um, service objects providing functionality <clears throat> for these uh, different types of, of uh, entities. And we have been doing the compatibility dance. Usually, um, or the, the, the general way we do this is we uh, create a new narrow interface, like maybe um, a page reference. Page reference is just the namespace ID and, a, and the, the title, the title text. Um, and then we change methods that only need these bits, right, to accept that new narrow interface. And um, since we make the old class, in this case title, implement the new interface, um, that's a non-breaking change, at least for callers. And we need to replace methods that return the old class, and eventually we can remove the old class. So, um, yeah, in code, if we have a method that used to take a user object, we can change it. Quite, yeah, we can change it to now take a user int user identity, which is much more narrow um, and has uh, much stronger guarantees. Uh, but if there was some some code in an extension maybe that was subclassing um, the class that defines this method and was overriding this method, that was would of course be broken because we changed the signature. Um, and so changing the stable interface policy or defining a policy that says that um, overriding methods is generally unsafe allowed us to do this, this kind of changes. For methods that return an instance of the old type, um, things are harder, of course. We cannot just uh, change this to um, return a super type because that may break code that relies on the return value. So we actually have to replace the method and deprecate the old method and eventually remove it. So yes, we are trying to replace the monster classes with a lightweight, lightweight vocabulary without breaking things. And um, that makes for a slow going sometimes. Uh, I try to visualize a little bit here what that means for extensions. For extensions, um, you may have a hook handler that gets instances of user or title or, I don't know, edit page or whatever passed in. And then uh, the hook handler typically will use these uh, values again in calls to core and um, passes them back to some, some utility uh, code in, in core, right? So the first step is to allow this utility code to accept the new narrow types. Um, and then we can define new hooks that only expose the new more narrow types. And after that has happened, then the hook handler can change, accept the narrow types and loop these through back to the utility calls in core. And yeah, we are kind of in the middle of this and I expect that we will um, keep going on it for at least another year or so until we are starting to see things fall in place and um, the old stuff actually going away. So what can you do if you are uh, the author and maintainer of an extension? You can stop using title and use link target or page reference or page identity instead as appropriate. And um, if you need to do operations, perform operations on, on pages, you could try to use the new page store service um, to, to do that. Similarly, you should avoid using the user class. You should rely on user identity or authority instead and um, use user group manager or user options lookup and related services to perform operations on, on users. You should also, if at all possible, um, avoid access to globals directly and always go via the uh, via config objects. Um, this is something that we are currently working on. We are trying to remove uh, access to configuration via global variables inside core within the next couple of weeks. 
hopefully before the end of the year. And uh, extensions should do this as well as soon as possible. There is a couple of replacements coming up for that, but they are not yet merged and um, the, the uh, proposed interfaces are kind of in flux. Um, this is a, yeah, this is not directly related to the expedition work. It's not directly related to untangling. Um, this is driven by a different need, but uh, getting rid of globals is always a good thing that makes code um, easier to reason about, more stable and safer. Yeah, this is a kind of um, a little bit of preview of what's going to happen to settings, just as, a, as an aside. Uh, we plan to add support to MediaWiki for loading configuration from, from um, data files from JSON and YAML. So uh, you don't have to use code as configuration. We are introducing the idea of cacheable config sources and uh, different kinds of configuration sources could be implemented, uh, for instance, to, um, to load configuration from the database. We are thinking about introducing hierarchical configuration nodes so you can have uh, sub-configuration objects for different subsystems or extensions. And we are hoping to introduce a simple concept of Wikiforms into core, which so far only worked via having uh, custom hacks basically in local settings. Overall, please be patient. Oh, uh, oh, okay, there's the animation, right? Please be patient. Um, if you have a car with four flat tires, right? Um, fixing one is already uh, quite a bit of work and maybe satisfying, you know, being done with that is satisfying to the person doing it, but the car still won't go, right? You will not actually see any benefit until you fix all four. And um, yeah, we are making progress, but it will be a while. That is it. Um, and I would be happy to answer any questions or discuss or we'll discuss the changes that we are um, about. To Thanks, make. Daniel. <clears throat> Thanks very much. I don't see a question yet, but I, I do have one. Um, we at Wikibase, we have a, a policy to go from one long-term support uh, release to, an, to the next. So we, we are not afraid of skipping intermediate uh, versions, but uh, in this case, uh, with so much going on, I might, uh, I, perhaps you advise advise against it. So, what's your what's your opinion? How would what would you do? Skipping um, skipping releases for if you're running a wiki or when you are maintaining an extension. Which, which what's the use case that that you are thinking of? Um, well, uh, mostly yeah. Um, running a wiki, but I, I think the, 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 I'm not sure if the, if the distinction is, uh, I think both. Yeah, I think the question is for both. I think for running a wiki, it shouldn't make that much of a difference. Um, for running a wiki, it typically the, you run into issues with major schema changes. Also, if we are changing the way that we store things, um, then issues are more likely to show up. Uh, and that's, we are, we may also be doing that, but it's, it's unrelated to what I'm just, what I was just talking about. Uh, for maintaining extensions, it kind of depends, you know, making smaller steps may be easier. Um, you may not have to make um, major changes at once. On the other hand, you will have to make more changes more often, right? Maybe it's easier to just wait until all the, you know, the, the nice new world is complete so you can just switch over to it instead of have to deal with the, the partial state of um, having some bits migrated to the shiny new world and some bits still requiring you to use the, I don't know, using title, for instance. It, one example is that we have replaced... Um, so in, in order to get information about uh, the, the state of a page, like I don't know, current revision and so on, you no longer need the title object. You can use um, the page record for that. But if you need 
to get the, um, a URL for that page, you still need to use the title object because we have not yet factored that out. Um, and yeah, depending on what you want to do, yeah. small steps or bigger steps may be better. I can't, yeah, I, I don't have a general advice. Uh, <clears throat> Jeroen has a question. Is there, any, uh, is there any connection between the initiative and the addition of support for PHP 8? Mm, not directly. So PHP 8 has some features that makes this easier. Um, union types, for instance. Um, union types make the migration easier because we can simply declare uh, a method to take um, one or the other type in a certain place, right? That makes makes stuff easier other than that so the, the the change to php 8 does not drive this initiative and um yeah having having more language features makes it somewhat easier but there's no stronger connection than that and i think scott has a has a, um, an interesting remark he, i think what he says is if you skip the intermediate releases or don't test your that is true uh, yeah, your your extensions. You are not getting the deprecation warnings, and you. Yeah, we we issue deprecation warnings for one release, right? Of course, and if you skip to the next stable release, and you are not doing maintenance on your extension, um, and you are not following along with at least testing, uh, then you will just things will just break, right? A method that used to exist for releases ago will now just be gone. Um, that's not new. Uh, that has always been the case. Deprecation was always said to be one or two releases, um, but we have been pushing on it a lot more than we did before. We are much quicker now to actually proactively remove usages in core and also in extensions and um, actually removing code as soon as we possibly can um, while conforming to the stable interface policy. Uh, we have been dragging around deprecations for 10 releases in some cases, and that's just not a healthy state because then deprecation kind of uh, loses meaning. People don't no longer believe that this stuff will actually go away and start ignoring it, so that's not good. Yeah. One thing, when... when um, one thing that I would urge people to do is when a release can candidate comes out, uh, they should run tests for their extension against the release candidate. So they know what they would need to fix to be compatible to the next release. If they want to be compatible to that release, right? If there are some extensions that only target, uh, target long-term support releases, then you don't have to do that. But then, of course, the failures you may see when you then go and test um, may be a bit more harsh than deprecation warnings. Thank you very much. I don't see any any other questions. And um, well, thank you very much. It, I think it was a very uh, a very interesting a very interesting uh, presentation, Daniel. So. Yeah, thank Thank you for having me and everyone, please uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have more questions later. Thank you. Thank you.